The thing that I want you to remember is that we had lots of both. We had lots of inputs and we had lots of outputs. In, in most cases, we had many more outputs than we had inputs, but we definitely just did not just have one input and one output. But from study theme two up to now, we've spent our whole life or all of our time modeling systems that look like this block diagram, where there's just one input and one output. And so the obvious question arises, but Carl, wait a minute. We spend all this time developing these huge models with lots and lots of inputs and outputs, and we've only really analyzed systems with one input and one output. How do we extend the analysis that we've done up to now to systems that are more realistic, that actually have multiple inputs and outputs? And the answer is that because of the way that we've simplified our systems to linear systems, I've alluded to this a little before, we can take any number of inputs and we can always express the effect of multiple inputs on any output by adding them together. There's no way in which multiple inputs have an effect on a single output in any other way than their normal if, or their effects through a transfer function just added together after we have spent the time linearizing. And so for, for the kinds of systems that we'll be analyzing, this is the whole of the story for handling multiple inputs. How do I predict the effect of multiple inputs on one output? I simply add all the effects together. This property in mathematical terms is known as the property of superposition. It, it works in two ways. It works on the one side because we can add two different uh, input shapes together to get their effect on an output, but we can also add the effects of two different inputs together to get their total effect. And it's always addition, right? Now, what if we have multiple outputs? Well, the story stays similarly simple. I just have to extend my block diagram a little bit and say I've got a different effect on each one of these outputs. And so in one has an effect through this G, which I'll call G21, and in two has an effect like this, which I'll call G2. And so I want you also to understand that this isn't necessarily like a new block diagram, it's just a combination of the two block diagrams together. Now the math that corresponds to this is very simple. It just says that out one is equal to g11 times in one plus g12 times in two and out two is equal to g21 in one times g plus g22 in two. And again, if you look at that closely, you'll notice that this follows the same form that I've been advocating you to use for transfer functions since the beginning, because I think that it aids this transition from SISO to MIMO. I've been telling you not to think of transfer functions as a ratio, but rather as a coefficient, right? And here we can see this clearly. Now that we have multiple inputs, and multiple outputs, it's much clearer to say that a transfer function is the coefficient of the input. So in other words, I would say there's a transfer function that relates input one to output one, and it is the coefficient of that variable when I write my equations in this form. Out is equal to some linear combination of the inputs. Now, the next step is really simple because once we have our equations in this form, we can really easily generalize this idea and notice that we've seen blocks of linear equations like this before in our linear algebra class. And most of you should be, uh, be able to easily understand that I can write this in matrix form as out one, out two as a vector is equal to G11, G12, G21, G22, 
G22 times their respective inputs. And this new transfer function over here, or this new matrix over here, we can call that a transfer function, uh, and we can actually call this out is equal to G times in. Notation varies. Uh, the textbook likes uh, bolding these things. It's really hard to bold things when I'm writing with my pen. I like the notation that I'm using here, which is to underline the uh, mathematical structure with its dimensions, number of lines. So this is, I'm stealing it from tensor notation, so you can basically see that out is a one-dimensional thing and G is a two-dimensional thing easily by just investigating how many lines I've under, underlined. Um, I'm also fine with it using an overbar. I find that that confuses people because it clashes with notation that we've used before to indicate the steady state value. Uh, I am relatively adept at deciphering whatever notation you choose to use from context, so don't worry too much about it. But this is the whole story in terms of how we're going to represent multivariable systems with more than one input in a compact way. 